Hi everyone, my name is Steve. Today, I'm going to go through the second part of my notes of how I passed AWS Certified SysOps Admin Associate exam. Uh, last time, I shared my feelings right after I took the exam, so this time I've organized the rest of my notes for how I prepared for this Certified SysOps Admin Associate exam. I'd like to go through that with you. But still, the notes I'm going to share by no means are going to, I intended to be a comprehensive list of notes before you could feel prepared and confidently to walk into your exam room. No, I just want to share some of the notes that I made um, or the highlights that I took a note of while I was preparing for the exam and share that uh, with everyone else who's preparing and working hard for this certification exam. With that said, let's get into the video. All right, now let's get started about uh, the second part. Uh, the agenda for this video, I'm going to cover these eight parts or these eight different services of AWS to help people better prepare for the uh, for their upcoming SysOps ME exam. CloudTrail, Amazon Athena, Cloud Hardware Security Module, Cost Explorer, IPv6, AWS Organizations, AWS CloudFront, and then Support Plan Tiers. That's the plan. All right, now let's dive in. First is CloudTrail. Uh, one thing to note is CloudTrail is enabled by default when your account is created. I was able to verify that. First, I was not 100% convinced, so I just went into my own AWS account and found that. So this is CloudTrail. You see, I've never enabled this CloudTrail myself, so it's there, it's always there. So it's there by default. I've never touched it. So this CloudTrail, so just to share my experiences with you, this is true. So CloudTrail is enabled when your account is created. So you don't need to enable it yourself. I think it makes sense. It provides the final locks for whichever API or whichever action that the admin or the developer did uh, associated with your AWS resources, right? I think that makes total sense. Another thing to note is that if you want to see insights, then you need to create or enable trails, CloudTrail trails. This is something that you need to manually create or enable so that you can see the insights. Again, go back to my own AWS account, you can see CloudTrail Insights is not enabled. This is something that you need to manually do. You need to create a trail or enable your trails, create a trail, right? Before you can see any insights. So if you want to see insights, you really want to create a trail, otherwise you get nothing. So uh, hopefully that leaves a deep impression on you so that you know for insights, this is something that you need to enable. But for CloudTrail, it's enabled by default when your account is created. So when you just go to aws.amazon.com, sign up for an account, at that moment, as long as you are verified, your CloudTrail is enabled. Next, if you configure to deliver your CloudTrail logs to S3 buckets, they are automatically encrypted using server-side encryption S3. Your logs, your CloudTrail logs delivered to S3 buckets are automatically encrypted which is great for integrity purpose. The second one is Amazon Athena. We want to understand that Athena is a tool that you can run SQL queries to help you analyze data stored in S3. Athena can process unstructured, semi-structured, and structured data sets. Examples include CSV, comma-separate values, or JSON, or Avro, or columnar storage formats such as Apache Parquet and Apache ORC. Both of them are very commonly used these days. Here's a link, you might want to take a look. And also, we often combine the usage of both Athena and QuickSight. QuickSight is used for easy visualization. QuickSight is something additional that you need to sign up for. But Athena is just, a, it's open in your AWS console. Also, take a look at the FAQs of Athena. Third one I want to briefly mention is Cloud Hardware Security Module. Cloud Hardware Security Module is a cloud-based hardware security module that enables you to easily generate and use your own encryption keys on the AWS cloud. It can take up SSL or TLS processing for your web servers. And TLS is used to confirm the identity of web servers and establish the secure HTTPS connections over the internet. And using cloud hardware security module reduces the burden on your company's web servers and provides an extra layer of security by storing the web server's private key in Cloud Hardware Security Module. And also to note is Cloud HSM is a dedicated hardware device and it's single-tenanted. 
those are the notes that I took. So hopefully those make sense to you. If it doesn't, please pause the video and spend some time, do some research, go through the FAQ or find some examples of Cloud HSM. Fourth one is AWS Cost Explorer. Uh, don't underestimate this part. It shows up pretty often. I can almost guarantee that it's going to show up as the exam blueprint set. It's just going to probe your knowledge about cost control. So play around with Cost Explorer. With Cost Explorer, two types of reports are generated for reserved instances. For this, let me show you guys two types of reports. As we see here, two types of reports are generated for reserved instances. So here is my Cost Explorer. You see here for reservations, there's utilization report and coverage report because I don't have any reserved instances, so I have nothing here, but it's good to play around this so that you can understand what I'm talking about and what the question is asking about. Again, the best thing to do is to really sign up for an AWS account, play around with different services, or just log into the UI, log into the console, you can understand things better. It will leave a deeper impression on you. Number one is utilization report. This is something like you could be easily tricked off. Utilization report is something about the usage of your reserved instance in terms of reserved instance purchased and the reserve instance used. This is compared with on-demand cost for the same amount of utilization and provides net savings for using reserved instance. And another report is called RI, Reserved Instance Coverage Report. It means how many hours of instance usage is covered by reserved instance and the hours spent on on-demand instances. This shows how much savings could have been made if reserved instances were used instead of on-demand instances. Of course, everybody knows that on-demand is relatively more expensive than reserved instances. But for reserved instances, it makes total sense if you know you're going to run your workload, if you're going to run your web server for like a year or two years, right? then you can go ahead and purchase the reserved instances, which in comparison to on-demand instances, is going to save, a, save you a lot. So these two reports are going to give you detailed insights into this. And both of these two reports can be saved in .csv file. So remember this is not .json file or .any other format. It, both of them can be saved in .csv file instead of a PDF file. Here is a link, feel free to take a look as well. For Cost Explorer, there's also DBR. This is a deprecated one, Detailed Billing Reports, and it's superseded by AWS Cost and Usage Reports, CURB. So CURB provides a comprehensive cost details for all resources in AWS. Also, we can have customized reports. Remember, you could be easily tested and the question could easily show up in your exam, say, which kind of report? Uh, can you customize your reports? You can, to what extent can you customize, right? So remember to take a look and play around with it. Query can provide multiple files, which consist of data files for usage, separate files for discounts, if any, or a man manifest file listing data files in the report. And also the columns in the query can be added or removed based upon customer requirements. Another link, feel free to take a look as well. Number five I want to talk about is IPv6. It's pretty easy and straightforward. I don't think it's going to ask you a lot, but if they do, make sure that you know these. IPv6 addresses are globally unique and therefore they are public by default. I hope that makes sense. I just remembered that. So if you want your instance that works on IPv6 to be able to access the internet, but no incoming traffic from the internet, you'll want to use an egress only internet gateway. As its name suggests, it makes total sense, right? So it's egress only, an internet gateway. And remember, this type of gateway is only for IPv6. Another link, please feel free to take a look. Another question that you want to understand is how you can ensure your, EC, your new EC2 instances can communicate over IPv6. How can you do that? So you want to ensure that your VPC works in dual stack mode. This dual stands for IPv4 and IPv6, or both. So let them communicate independently over each other. Then I want to talk about AWS organizations. For sure, this is guaranteed. This is a very cool and powerful feature, and it's very useful and practical. Except imagine a relatively bigger organization, you need to set up multiple AWS accounts, right? Then AWS organization comes into play. It's super handy. And I guarantee you, it's going to show up in your cloud practitioner exam, in your sysops exam, in your solution architect exam, in your uh, certified uh, developer associate exam. And it's still going to show up in the professional level 
exams. So make sure that you play around with this and get a good understanding of this. One thing I noted is you want to enable billing alerts before you can create billing alarms, right? That makes total sense. You want to enable billing alerts first. Another thing is how you can set up AWS organizations. I'm going to have a dedicated another video to walk through how we can set up AWS organizations. It's going to be very cool. And you want to understand this. So basically you have a master account which can invite existing AWS accounts to join your organization by using their either their AWS account ID or the associated email. Another thing to note is a master account can never be affected by service control policies. You can set up service control policies, but it's used to manage your member accounts. A master account is not affected. And another good note is a member account cannot be upgraded to a master account. In an AWS organization, there's only one master account. Also, please take a look at the FAQs of the AWS organization's service. Seventh topic is CloudFront. This is an old topic, but I still made a couple notes before I walk into the SysOps admin exam. Popular objects reports. This is a report that can be used to help identify the most accessed items in your CloudFront. This is just a term in your CloudFront service, right? Popular objects reports. And if you run a CPI or HIPAA compliant workloads, AWS recommends customers to log CloudFront usage data for the last 365 days for auditing purpose. How can you do this? You can do this by enable CloudFront access logs and also capture requests that I sent to the CloudFront API. The last thing I want to talk about today is the support plans. This is a screenshot that I took from AWS official website. There are four different tiers. Here it only says three. The very basic one is called the basic plan. It's right here on the left side. It's not showing up on, on their website. But the most basic one, if you pay nothing, that is basic. And then there is developer, there is business, there is enterprise. Something to notice, the next level of AWS support plan is always a superset of its predecessor, which means business contains everything that developer plan has and enterprise contains everything that business plan has. So I hope that makes sense. You want to read through this. So you might get a question asking you which AWS support plan will offer you phone support, right? So if you see here, this is the very first plan, business plan that offers phone support. Developer and basic, they don't offer phone support. And most is email access support, right? So take a look at this link. You don't want to uh, miss that. Another thing that you want to know which level of support that you can get. For example, if my production system is down, which plan is going to give you quick access to support? That is business plan. So you see here, when your production system is down, the business plan is the plan that's going to give you quick access. It's not a developer plan. So these are things you want to take a look. Just to go to this link, the FAQ of the premium support. Take a look. That's all that I have for the second part of the certified SysOps admin exam. I hope this is useful. If you do find this is useful, please do me a favor and hit the like button. That's going to help a lot with the YouTube algorithm. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel as we continue to go through a lot of very useful tutorials to help people better prepare for their upcoming AWS certification exams. And also we'll explore all different technologies. My channel is all about technology and programming and computer science. If you don't want to miss out a future video, definitely hit the subscribe button. I'll see you guys in the next one.